Paul Murphy, it's a pleasure having a hero like yourself on the pink couch. Now you're a hero in more than one sense to us here in Kilkenny. You're just back from your third peacekeeping trip in the Lebanon as Lieutenant Paul Murphy. Um, it was a bit longer than you expected this time because of COVID. Yeah, um, we were due to go from November to May and unfortunately as, as the world changed, COVID came in, we were extended until July. Now, at the time, we didn't know when we'd be extended until um, the dates changed a few times, but finally we came home on the 2nd of July, thankfully. And like, what did you do when you were out there in lockdown? Were you still on your military duties or did you just go into pure lockdown? Um, well, once we knew that COVID was going to be a big factor, we went into lockdown, you know, quite early on and reacted very quickly to it. Um, and then, you know, which I think stood to us in the long run because from there we were able to put in our own procedures going forward to, I suppose, mitigate, which is the big word now, you know, mitigate against the threat of COVID. So our patrols did continue, um, but they continued in the sense that we weren't mixing with locals. We didn't get out of our vehicles. We didn't mix with the Lebanese army. It was very much once you left the camp in your vehicle, you stayed in your vehicle until you returned four or five hours later. So we had to keep that footprint on the ground out there but also at the same time keep a distance from locals because we were very conscious of, you know, putting the, the locals at ease that basically, you know, we're not going to bring COVID into, into their communities. And like, did you have to wear the full PPE equipment and on top of your army gear as well? Or what was it like? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We had to wear our masks. We had to be, look, again, I suppose the spirit gel and uh, the hand sanitizers aren't too big of a burden. But um, yeah, people on patrol or people leaving the camp, you know, again, it was masks and it was very important to be seen to be wearing masks again, just for, you know, I suppose, comfort in the locals, really, that, you know, we were doing everything we could. So, mm -hmm. yeah, people were doing four or five hour patrols with, with masks. Irish troops for over 60 years have given unbroken service to keep in peace abroad in conflict zones. But what does it mean for you, Lieutenant Paul Murphy? What do you have to do professionally? What's your role? For me as an officer, so my job was, I was an operations officer um, with the battalion. So previously when I would have went as a corporal, I was very much doing the patrol. So I was on the ground patrolling through villages, working with the Lebanese army. So as an officer this time, as an operations officer, you were pretty much at the other side of the table then. You were coordinating all of the operations. So, you know, we would figure out where we would send patrols, what patrols were doing, what was the feedback we were getting from, you know, the towns and villages and, you know, how we would best coordinate our patrols, really. So the patrols I used to be on, this time I was now part of, you know, organising these patrols, making sure they were going to certain areas, hitting the targets of the amount of patrols you were meant to do each day, each week and each month. So that was very much the side of the, the house I was on this time. So it was looking at the people who were doing the patrols and get, getting the feedback from them. And it was your third trip. You've been to Chad and Lebanon twice. Does it get easier every time? Um, I, I suppose each mission is different. Chad was a, it was a very hard trip in the sense that, you know, it, it was a case of going back to the old the old days of one phone call or two phone calls a week. You had to book in to get the phone call. It wasn't a case you, everyone had Wi-Fi. Um, it wasn't a case you could get posts. Whereas if you go to Lebanon, you have Wi-Fi. You can make calls, which makes it a lot easier. Again, I suppose as, as soldiers go on, you know, you get married or you have kids and that makes trips a little bit harder as well. But no, this was it was a great trip. We had great we had great um, we had great people on the trip. So it doesn't get easier as you go. Certainly not. But I suppose once you get a bit more street smart as well, in, in that sense, it does get a small bit easier. Yeah. And like you spent Christmas as well in the conflict zone, um, lockdown and everything. How does that affect your mental being? Um, yeah, I suppose the uncertainty was the biggest part of it for, for troops out there because, again, nobody saw this coming. And when we were told we, we weren't going home, you know, I think people's mindsets kind of changed to, OK, what is the situation? And we realised very quickly that if anything did happen at home, unfortunately, you know, we wouldn't be returning home. So if some, a loved one was to get sick, you know, just the way the world is at the moment, we weren't coming home. So certainly soldiers had to think about that. And, you know, our families were brilliant, as as, as they always are. And basically supported us through that. Thankfully, you know, everybody came through unscathed at home. There was no family members who, who got sick or, you know, anything to that effect. So, you know, it, it certainly was a challenging time for soldiers, um, especially, again, if you have small kids at home. You know, you see yourself as being the person who has to be there to protect the family. And if, if you're not there, you know, it's kind of, you know, that can be tough, certainly, as well. So, you know, soldiers, I suppose, you know, everybody rode around, supported each other. And, you know, we just, I suppose, ploughed on with the job we had and... It wasn't easy, but at the same time, 
you know, there was a kind of mentality of, look, we are where we are, we'll just get on with it. You know? And you kept up the bit of hurling too while you were away. Obviously, you had to keep up the strength and conditioning for the Kilkenny squad. Yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose long before we left, we had plans for that in, in, in motion. Um, you know, we had the hurls sent. We, we would send baggage before we go. So we sent the hurls with that and the balls and whatever else. And, you know, we would have got our programs from our strength and conditioning coaches. Again, it's not just um, players from Kilkenny are out there. We had lads from Tipperary, Cork, Limerick, wherever, you know, you name it. There's lads, there's lads there playing hurling. So everybody had their own instructions and... You kind of had to get a bit creative, really. You know, you didn't have a hurling pitch when you were being sent drills or you were being sent um, fitness programs. Everything outside of the gym was very much based on hurling pitch and being on a pitch and running and different things. So we didn't have that out there. So we kind of had to get creative. How are you to do your interval runs? How are you going to do your longer runs and so on? So it was enjoyable. It was it was great. We had great structure to our training. If you were to do it again, there was days where work got in the way and. Likewise, you know, you just you just couldn't get out to get get to your run, but that's just the nature. Of work has to come first out there. So no, we got we got great training in. We slept well, we ate well, and then look, some of the days work got in the way, and yeah. there was no training for a few days. So how many hours training would you be expected to do? In terms of with Kilkenny, yeah. Or, well, I suppose you know every club player, and county player at the moment, they do have a fairly strenuous program. If you're playing at a good level. Um, between I suppose your strength and conditioning program getting into the gym but also your running and I'm sure you know you can't leave the hurl out of your hand for too long either so it, there's a lot there and again it depends on how much if you want to do that bit extra again which some players will want to do a bit extra so I suppose it's it's um you know it's a very busy schedule if you're trying to get everything in sometimes you have to prioritize look I'm not going to get out for my gym program today but I'll get 20 minutes pucking the ball against the wall or whatever so you know, it's it's a busy program and you really do have to plan ahead to try and fit everything into it. You were originally supposed to return to Kilkenny in May and Kilkenny was supposed to be playing in a county championship match that weekend. Um, with the cancellation of GA games with COVID, it's actually given you a little bit of a silver lining. Yeah, well, that's it. You know, when, when myself and Richie Reid were leaving on this trip, we knew that we were going to be home around the time Kilkenny were going to be starting championship and being realistic, you know, you don't just walk back into a setup. Nobody walks back in, um, especially not the Kilkenny setup. And, you know, you need a few weeks to condition back to being on a pitch. As, as fit as you're going to be, you're not match fit and you're not as sharp as you're going to be on a pitch. So you need a few weeks to get ready. Um, I suppose, like you said, the silver lining for us was that COVID knocked everything back. So realistically, once that happened, we said, OK, we're actually in no rush back here for any hurling matches. Um, we've also got our few weeks with the club now, so you know players are feeling fresh, especially the likes of myself and Richie, who, you know, maybe didn't get a bit of hurling. A few lads got league matches and and so on, but you know we're after getting back to the clubs, uh, you know, a lot of training in, a lot of matches, so we're actually set in perfect position really for Kilkenny returning in September. So yourself and Richie are raring to go. Raring to go, <laughs> absolutely. Um, what's training like now with the clubs, like with um, COVID restrictions? Yeah, with COVID restrictions, again, you know, um, the GA were very quick, I suppose, to outline measures to, I suppose, protect players upon returning. Um, before going training now, it, it is a very different world. Dress rooms are essentially gone at this stage, you know, um, showers, everything. You come to the match. It's, I suppose, it's, it's funny. It's like you're that 10 year old boy returning as you, as you started out to hurling. You're coming up to the pitch, togged out. You have your bottle of water, you have your hurl in your helmet and, and, and on you go, really. Um, players are talking out on the side of the pitch. You fill out your form every evening before training. So it's the GA COVID form, basically saying that you feel no symptoms. You you know have no reason to believe that you have COVID-19. And you log that each time you go training. So there is a record there. Again, clubs have uh, COVID officers at the moment. So it's, yeah, look, there's great measures there. Um, training is excellent at the moment. Club players are getting matches every weekend, which is huge. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't always happen over the summer with the way it's gone. Inter-county usually gets priority. So I think club players are really enjoying it, you know, really enjoying matches. And the fact that I suppose players or sorry, supporters can see them on YouTube now at the moment. It's yeah. it's actually a great time really, I suppose, for clubs at the moment, except that the supporters can't go. I know, is it strange? Playing in a stadium or a, a, you know, a yeah. place where you can't hear the roars of the crowd and it, it is, but I don't. I suppose players don't think about it when you. We, we played our first match in Nolan Park, and at that time you're allowed two hundred people at the game. So there was maybe a hundred people in the stand. You know, mm -hmm. after both teams had all their players, there was about room for a hundred people in the stand. 
Um, when you arrived in Nolan Park, it was certainly unusual to see Nolan Park with only 100 people there. But once the game kicks off, you forget about that because it's so intense. You're not thinking yeah. how many if people in are in the stand. Because yeah. I think a few places yeah. were trying to put in background audience noises and stuff. No, no, sure. I don't think that would work. No. <laughs> you were probably cheered at the wrong time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you got engaged last year. Congratulations. Was it in Lisbon that you popped the question? I was ready to go overseas eight weeks later. Um, and we were in Lisbon, so we got engaged in Lisbon. Great. It was very exciting times. It was exciting as well. Just before we were going, we had a good few weeks of, you know, meeting our friends and having a few drinks and everything. So it was exciting times and, you know, also being able to plan for the future when he came back. So it was great. It was very exciting. And how are wedding plans now with COVID? Yeah, look, I suppose we're, we're very... We were proactive very early on. I think Alien was very proactive very early on and we booked our date and we got our venue and so on. So, you know, once COVID kicked in and I think we saw people's weddings being pushed back and, you know, we, we went for 2021. So okay. a lot of people now are actually pushing the weddings into 2021. So, you know, we didn't know that COVID was coming down the line, but once it did come, we were kind of happy. Look, we have a lot of things booked here now. We still have a lot of things to do, but we feel like we're in a good position and we have our date, which is probably the most important thing at the time as well. Do you think you'll be as nervous that day as you will be, like the day that you've been entering Crow Park for I think I'll be more Ireland. nervous. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, last question, your favourite match ever? My favourite match ever? Um, I, I think it's hard to pick between club and county. My favourite match with the club would have been, I think, the junior county final in 2006. It might sound funny, but we hadn't, our club, hadn't won junior in about 70 years at this stage. So we had been a junior club as long as I had known, as long as my father was alive, we were a junior club. So that was a very important day for our parish. It was a huge day. We'd won intermediate since, but I still think the junior was huge for us. It was kind of shaking that ghost off you and you could go forward now and enjoy intermediate and we're senior now. So that was great. But I think also maybe with Kenny, a match that was very special was we played Tipperary in Nolan Park in 2013. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing on the line except someone staying in the championship, really. Um, and, you know, we remember here, and it was a sunny day. It was a summer's evening, Saturday evening in Nolan Park. You got to play a championship match in Nolan Park, which is brilliant. You don't always get to do that. Um, and also the crowds, the place was wedged. You couldn't get a ticket all week. I think the crowds were there for about two or three hours before it. So we went in, people expecting us to be bet. We won. And, you know, it was just a great evening. It was kind of what you play inter-county for. Mm -hmm. So probably one of the, not one of the lesser known matches, but just a great day. It wasn't one of the other Ireland ones. 2013 in Nolan Park was, was a great one. Do you know what? We'll be looking back at them and saying they were the days. They were the days. Back, and... back in the day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> when yeah, the yeah. stadiums were packed. Yeah. Paul, thank you so much for coming along and chatting to us today um, on the Pink Couch. Um, it was a pleasure talking to you and to get a little bit of an insight into the day in the life of Paul Murphy. Thank you. Thanks very much, Yvonne.